Um, so first I wanna thank uh, Sarah Oger, Michael Washburn, and the teams at Humanities New York and the Mellon Foundation uh, for making space for this vital and pressing set of questions and conversations regarding democracy and inviting you to, and inviting us to join your community for debate and discussion. Um, on our subject, what does democracy demand first principles? It's hard to imagine a more erudite, original and insightful group of thinkers than the ones I'm honored to moderate here tonight. So it's good to see all of you, all friends, and I'm a big fan of all of your work uh, and looking forward to the conversation. Um, once again, our format this evening is a town hall, which means that we will take questions at three intervals throughout the discussion and make sure we have an ongoing and open conversation, something that many of us think is essential to the very idea of democracy that we're discussing today. And in the interest of not prejudicing the conversation tonight, I really wanted to begin not with a statement outlining the various crises and threats that I think or that influential commentators think are the central problems for democracy in the present, but with a more fundamental question that I'll pose to each one of you. Uh, what do you think is most necessary at the level of principles or at the level of institutions, uh, at the level of culture itself for a free and open democracy? What's the most essential thing? What do you wanna put on the table for the audience to wrap their heads around as we begin this conversation? So Jed, let's start with you, followed by Leah, then David. Um, thank, thank you, Brandon. Uh, and I'm really um, humbled to, to be here with the three of you. Um, I'm not sure what I think is the most essential, but let me name a pair of things that I think are jointly essential and which I think are in the process of undercutting each other in the American democratic scheme right now. When we circle back, maybe we can talk about how they're, they're doing so. Um, one is the capacity to act collectively in an institutional form and a register of meaning that is distinct, distinctly political, distinctly sovereign, we might even say, and specifically is powerful enough and decisive enough to make it possible for a people to take control of their shared circumstances enough that things like climate change or globalization or oligarchy don't become forms of destiny, but objects of joint effort you can work on effectively. Um, and th the second thing is a willingness to be ruled by majorities of our co-citizens. Um, democracy has often in the last decades been talked about as a form of sociability, a form of conversation, um, a habit of, of accommodation and mutuality bending toward perennial openness. And, and there's something to all of that, but it's also a form of rule. Um, and it has to be for the first thing I said to be true, I think, to be able to make changes and choices that stick in the face of crises that otherwise burden us as kinds of destiny. Um, and for the choices to stick, we also have to be able to tolerate the idea of living with and sometimes living under one another's decisions. Um, and I think those are both hard now. And I think the ways that they are hard are, uh, are interconnected. Thanks for Leah. I think you're still muted. Yeah. 
the perils of Zoom life. Um, first, thank you guys for having me here today. And Brandon, thank you for um, moderating this discussion and for that terrific question. So as I think about the idea of democracy um, and the principles of democracy and values of democracy, I think one the thing that I wanna focus on is this idea of an egalitarian sense of freedom. And I think in this idea of an egalitarian sense of freedom is something that is a necessary component of a full democracy, a realized democracy and democracy as envisioned. Um, but it's particular for the most vulnerable within society, right? So this egalitarian sense of freedom that particularly applies to the most vulnerable, the most marginalized within society. I think that there is a sense, at least in the vision of our nation, that that is what democracy is, that is what democracy, how we act on democracy, this is what democracy should look like. The problem is that I don't think we've ever had a true egalitarian freedom in the sense of practice. And that's in part because our nation's vision of freedom has always been exclusionary. So I think this idea of freedom that we have in our nation and the way that it operates is exclusionary at its core. This is in conflict with what I would say is necessary for a truest sense, uh, for the true sense of democracy, which is this larger egalitarian sense of freedom, particularly for the most marginalized. And so I wanna use the idea of blackness, I think, in order to flush this out. And I think if we think about the idea or the concept of blackness or blackness as a collective, blackness is something that has always been seen as a threat to democracy as practiced within the United States. And it's never, because we've never fully addressed it or adequately kind of investigated it or even repaired it, right? This has not been resolved. In a sense, democracy is something that doesn't exist in full for black people within the United States. And I think we can see this in a number of protests that come out of not just the health pandemic that we see in this country, but also the racial pandemic that results kind of in the symbolic moment after the death of George Floyd. And so I'll just close by pointing to like thinking about George Floyd as this idea of democracy, the failures of democracy, and the failure of essentially the state more broadly uh, in this democratic project. When we think about George Floyd just more broadly, and we think about the symbolism of him, he becomes a symbol of this kind of anti-democratic moment of that's exacerbated by the racial pandemic. Um, essentially, the state has failed Black people in its vision of democracy. And we see this economically, right, in all different dimensions. We see it economically, we see it in health, we see it in political institutions, right? George Floyd is in Minneapolis looking for work when he's killed. He has COVID-19 in his lungs when he is killed, right? Political institutions, not just the police, but political institutions by and large, including public institutions and representative democracy, so-called representative democracy, have also failed him. So again, I want us to, I really want us to think about what this idea of equal or egalitarian freedom means as a necessary component of democracy, but also the kind of complication that we've never actually had that because our actual democracy as it exists has always been exclusionary. Thank you, Leah. Uh, David. Uh, I'm going to, what may seem like dodge my responsibility but I hope perform it better than uh, I could unassisted by reading a favorite passage of mine uh, from uh, American thinking. This is uh, something near the end of an address that the philosopher William James gave at the unveiling of the uh, sculpture by St. Gaudens of the 54th Massachusetts, the black regiment that fought the assault on Fort Wagner in the Civil War. And James says in this paragraph, and I'm just going to read and then comment briefly, I have two principles and he names them. Democracy is still upon its trial. The civic genius of our people is its only bulwark and neither laws nor monuments, neither battleships nor public libraries nor great newspapers nor booming stocks, neither mechanical invention, nor political adroitness, nor churches, nor universities, nor civil service examinations can save us from degeneration if the inner mystery be lost. That mystery at once the secret and the glory of our English speaking race consists in nothing but two common habits, two inveterate habits carried into public life, habits so homely that they lend themselves to no rhetorical expression, yet habits 
more precious perhaps than any that the human race has gained. They can never be too often pointed out or praised. One of them is the habit of trained and disciplined good temper towards the opposite party when it fairly wins its innings. It was by breaking away from this habit that the slave states nearly wrecked our nation. The other habit is that of fierce and merciless resentment toward every man or set of men who break the public peace. By holding to this habit, the free states saved her life. I quote that passage instead of having tried to compose one of my own because I tend to think about politics negatively, which is to say, I have a much fairer time of it understanding what injustice is than trying to draw up for myself an outline of what justice is, either ideal or even present practical justice. And the second habit that uh, James uh, talks of here lines up pretty plainly, I think, with the uh, second point that uh, Jed made about uh, the need to be making from time to time choices that stick and to live under other people's uh, decisions. And just to prevent this from becoming too abstract, though I don't want to be controversial or polemical or altogether present-minded, um, the matter of uh, not allowing the other when it fairly wins its innings uh, to be shown your good temper has been something we've witnessed in two consecutive elections now, both of which were referred to by the losing party as stolen elections. I have a feeling I know what side of the two all four of us were on, but it is a fact that not only do we now find the losing party uh, trying to nail this election as having been contrived by a combination of maliciously programmed computers and wrongly counted votes. But in 2016, it may be remembered that uh, the losers of that election called it an election stolen by Russia. And that charge lingered on. And there were a great many editorialists, educators, media personalities, uh, who claimed that the elected president was a Russian agent. That has pretty well not panned out, but the feeling of mutual animosity that has gone on, and it dates from before 2016, I think bears out um, the essential truth of James's warning. So that's why I read that passage. David, could you just say something briefly about the public peace part? I'm sort of curious to hear you say just a, just a tiny bit more about that. Well, <clears throat> the public peace uh, being broken could refer to uh, the demonstrations which we saw reported of uh, chauvinist supporters of the current president in Washington, D.C., the Proud Boys, but it could also refer to the serial rioting that occurred in such cities as Seattle, Portland, Chicago, and Minneapolis after the killing of George Floyd, which destroyed hundreds of millions of dollars worth of small businesses. Those are both actions that come under the heading of breaking the public peace. Thank you. Um, so the striking thing I think about the claims that you've all put on the table, um, this idea of being able to uh, accept the, you know, the, the rule of your co-citizens, to be able to act collectively with a sense of shared destiny, um, to develop an egalitarian set, uh, a egalitarian sense of freedom and the kind of habits that that might demand. Uh, the kind of practices that might demand. Uh, the, the striking thing about 
all of those to me is that they, they both seem, they all seem really very demanding and robust in their sense of what democracy entails. We're not dealing with minimalist theories of democracy here where you just got to get some elections off the ground, right? Um, but they also seem extremely fragile in this moment. And those things I think are related. They, they seem, the possibility of achieving them for so many people seems very, very fragile. And for many people, I think the story they want to tell about why that is, why the things you're talking about are so uh, threatened is polarization. That's the kind of watchword of the age. Uh, it's polarization that makes us dysfunctional, self-undermining, corroded. Um, there was this paper just published by a group of social scientists in science uh, and what they called the problem of political sectarianism uh, and its threat to democracy because they thought the language of polarization and partisanship was too weak to capture the depth of division and distrust in American politics right now. And they think that too many Americans treat political policy and cultural disagreements as existential threats. Uh, they, they've got this view that some of the things that you guys were discussing, right, that they see that too many people in America see the opposing party as fundamentally other or antagonistic or somehow illegitimate participants in the process. Um, and that makes people perhaps think anti-democratic measures are more defensible and even violence should be used to, to, to stop the opposing partisans. Um, but each of you and your broad expansive corpuses, uh, I think a distinctive thing about your work is that you push us to situate all of the contemporary crises in larger problems, more sweeping historical stories, uh, problems about constitutional design, racial injustice, empire and militarism, capitalism and ecology. And so what I was hoping that you all might do for us is speak a bit on the contemporary account of polarization, but in light of your broader concerns, right? And whether you think the conventional story about polarization is actually leading us away from what we need to confront for real democratic repair. So for instance, you might think that one part of the polarization myth, right? If you wanna charge it as being one is that in previous eras, as Leah has laid out, African-Americans were largely marginalized from politics. So you're not really having to account for their contestation and agenda setting in many of the ways that you have to now, right? So that the story about polarization might not account for something like that. So I just want you to kind of respond to, to that thesis and, and give us a sense of it from the broader vantage of your work. So let me start with Leah uh, and then David and then Jed. Sure. So I think one of the things that I struggle or work through in my own research and work is that for me, polarization isn't simply political polarization, it's racial polarization, that the two ideas are intertwined, particularly when we do break down demographic breakdowns of political polarization, ideas, policies, the way people think, behave, behave, behave politically, right, ideas of linked fate. You can't understand those ideas without understanding ideas of racial polarization. And I'll take the example of women, for example. So there's a lot of conversation around how women trend in a certain direction. But actually, when we say that, what we're talking about are Black women trend in a liberal direction or a progressive direction. When we talk about working class, right, perhaps working class trending towards a conservative direction. No, we're actually talking about conservative, you know, talking about white working class workers trending in a particular direction because black and Latino working class voters and participants, you know, civic participants look very different in their policies and their preferences and their political voting behaviors. So for me, it, it really, you know, part of the way that I push back at this is saying that, you know, it coincides that when black voters fully get the vote, right, 1965 on forward, is when we begin to talk and have these conversations about political polarization. And so we have to root that out and actually look at kind of the racial differences and the racial poles in order to understand this. And then one other thing that I'll say, I think, and, and Brandon, you brought this up, is this idea that, you know, 
that we can, you know, functionally understand polarization and democracy without uh, in an in in an arena in which you know a big a really big cross section of the country simply hasn't been a part of the democratic conversation. So when I say democracy is fragile, right? I also mean that democracy historically is not just fragile, but it's violent, it's bloody, it's contested. It's something that has to completely, uh, has to be continually and consistently remade and rethought. And it oftentimes is the people who are on the outsides of democracy that are remaking it and expanding it to become something that is far more inclusive and tangible and touchable that looks like actual democracy on the ground. So. I don't necessarily think that we are in a moment that is radically different from periods in the past, but instead what it feels like is that the entire country is now going through with the most vulnerable, most vulnerable and marginalized members of our, you know, of our country racially have gone through historically. Thank you. David. I'll go at this from a tangent, maybe apologies in advance. Uh, one thing that has struck me in the last few years uh, is the presence of issues that in our most uh, conspicuous public debates are not discussed at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we are to speak of violence, the largest violences in which Americans have been involved uh, have been directed by Americans of more than one race against foreign countries. We have killed in the uh, years of the younger Bush, Obama, and Trump at a conservative estimate or created the conditions for the deaths of more than a million people in the greater Middle East, including North Africa. And yet these wars were not a subject of discussion in the election of 2004, in the election of 2008, very much, in the election of 2012, 2016, or 2020. It seems to me that the political uh, heart of democracy ought to consist of openness to discussion of the way public blood and treasure, to use the common phrase, is being spent and that there may be some connection between the bitterness, uh, the fractiousness with which contesting elements in this country now confront each other and our evasion of any real encounter with what we've been doing in the world. I mean, this is a standard pattern for empires, that violence that it directs outward. And I will repeat, this is violence out of proportion to what we talk of now in our cities, um, that that violence comes back home and leads to confrontations that have been otherwise postponed. We set up tripwires for new wars uh, in Eastern Europe after the coup in Ukraine. Uh, that's still, what to say, on the agenda for the incoming Biden administration, which does not look to be less warlike in that respect and in that area than the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. Barack Obama ended the war in Iraq, but started a disastrous war, catastrophic for the whole region, in Libya. And when you look at it from that angle, the difference between the two parties in this country uh, looks to be lacking in polarization. And uh, what the clue to this really is, I've never quite understood, but I, I do feel that our, our media, uh, our mainstream media have utterly failed the test of democracy on this point. Thank you. Um, Jed, I'm gonna come to you and then I just wanna let the audience know that we're gonna take questions right after Jed's response. Uh, so start typing in Q&A and I'll ask a few questions. I'm stilled by the weight of what the other two have said. I, I think David's last point is particularly essential to understanding where we are. On your, on your prompt um, though of 
polarization. I think we might distinguish between the polarization of a polity that's capable of resolving the questions put before it, polarization over whether to enact a Green New Deal, for example, or of what kind presented to a Congress able to muster legislative majorities that map a demographic and political majority of the actual country. Um, our constitution sets up in important ways an anti-majoritarian, anti-legislation machine and its anti-majoritarian features and its inhibitions on action have become more significant as they've coincided with a set of um, briefly ge geographic uh, distribution of partisan identification of voters, basically. Um, so couple this with, couple the fact that those who win or are seen to win in our elections are seldom able to do very much. And the more um, adequately they understand the structure and the depth of the crises that we're in, the less proportionately they're able to do. Um, and so to run a campaign that seeks to be, to build a party that seeks to be constructive in the face of our crisis is to play a kind of sucker's game and to ask your voters to play what will come over cycles to seem a kind of sucker's game. Because in some sense, everyone comes to think that there is a deep and necessary disconnection between political aspiration, political speech, and what actually emerges from politics. And in a sense, they're right, but it may not be a natural fact. It may be a constitutional fact in significant part that makes them right. This fact, I think it's fair to speculate, shifts the rewards of political leadership mm. toward fostering in your constituency the view that if you cannot help people to save themselves from fate, you can at least promise to save them from the other side. Campaigns of existential threat become the only kinds of campaigns that can get people out because they are run in a negative register of self-protection. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the last two presidential cycles have been experienced intensely in this register. It is also true that because the gap between a demographic majority, what I would call a proper democratic majority of the people who live in the country now, the gap between that majority and the governing majority that the constitution creates via the Senate, the electoral college in particular, um, has grown in such a way that we have now to, to bowdlerize an old term, uh, or to bastardize an old term, a concurrent majorities. Um, there was a sense in which for the last four years, both the constitutional majority and the democratic majority could understand themselves as in some way the proper majority in the country. I think the questionable term resistance, the impression people cultivated of being under a kind of occupation had something to do with the sense that in fact, it was not a majority that had authorized um, those in charge, but of course those in charge were working under the constitution. And so the, there's a sense in which the familiar ways that our political cultures have come apart, that the polarization conversation, the standard polarization conversation picks up are correct, um, correctly described, but may be rooted in constitutional deformations that are, as I was saying before, reciprocally tearing down or impeding our ability to do things in a meaningful way in a collective register and the disposition to live with other people's choices. So this speaks to one of the questions um, 
that we received in the in the chat, which is um, it sort of follows up on 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 some of the discussion that we're having about you know if we think the polarization framework uh, is a is a distraction of some sorts, right, or that it elides these deeper structural issues, right? It it, it elides the history of how we got here through racial formation. It elides the issues of um, of uh, military projection overseas that there's remarkable, at least deep state consensus on, uh, or it elides the deeper structural deformations that you might think regarding democracy and the constitutional order. What's the response then, right? What's, how do we cultivate a sense of, um, a willing concession, a willing, I mean, I'm thinking a lot about Danielle Allen's talking to strangers here, this idea that that so much of what democracy demands of you is sacrifice. Uh, the idea that, yes, we do sacrifice to a losing governing majority. We do so willingly, we're not happy about it, but we, uh, we, try, to wait, we try to find a way to continue to go on with others and argue and persuade people uh, that this was not the right path to take, that there's some other ways to think about that. How do we go about cultivating that sense? Or is that only something that happens in the atmosphere of deep, deep structural reform, or a perhaps more radical overhaul of, um, or even eclipse of those kinds of norms going forward? Let me say some, something brief, just so somebody will say something. Uh, <laughs> uh, one one important uh, gift, it's, it's been said, uh, of a statesman, that is to say a leader, uh, anything you if you like, from, from mayor to governor uh, to uh, president. Uh, besides making decisions, which is the glamorous and impressive and often catastrophically burdensome part of leadership, but uh, explanation, explaining what the logic of the decision is. And we have uh, lived a long time, I think, these last 20 years um, with policies of different kinds, um, many of which <laughs> I will confess under Democrats, I agreed with, but from whichever side, very little talent for and very little energy expended on explanation. Mm -hmm. I think we're suffering in part still now from the long-term remote but predictable consequences of Americans having gotten no very good explanation of the financial collapse of 2007, 2008. That could have been the first business of a new incoming government in 2009. We know what was the first business, something very estimable and worthwhile, healthcare. But uh, this absence of explanation leads to recrimination, reproach, uh, theories of conspiracy, um, and blaming people um, and imposing guilt for the past rather than being able to think sensibly uh, about how the past connects with the present and the future. I think that's a big problem. I think it's probably one of the hopes people have of this incoming demonstration that more talent for explanation will be shown. I'll just stop there. Yeah, this brings me back to a kind of John Stuart Mill point, right? This idea that, look, you've got to get out there, argue it out, explain to people and the better answer, the better explanation should sort of rise to the top. But of course, our politics is saturated um, with an extreme amount of wealth. Uh, there's a lot of money flowing into politics that's only grown since Citizens United. Um, and one of the questions we have from the chat is, uh, how does the amount of money in politics affect these kinds of um, themes, these questions that we're, we're discussing here? How does it affect the prospects for the uh, 
the ascendancy of explanation, uh, for instance, or these these questions about the resentment at feeling like um, your voice is not really co-equal in the creation of the society that you live in. Uh, could you all speak to that? Maybe I'll start with with Jed and then let you guys jump in as you as you see fit. I'll say something very quick to it, um, which risks superficiality, but the most sort of fresh-faced and full-throated expression of the John Stuart Mill idea that I've seen in public in the last decade is in Justice Kennedy's opinion in Citizens United, in which he explains that the reason no corruption of public deliberation and decision can ever arise from political spending is that all political spending is a testament to the respect that the spenders have for the ultimate sovereignty of the people. The sort of blend of airset civic republicanism with the most naive form of the neoclassical theory of advertising as useful information for fully informed consumer decisions, it's just extremely egregious. Um, set that opinion alongside the climate of opinion in another sense that made Donald Trump in the eyes of so many who supported his 2016 campaign, an effective critic of plutocrats, of the plutocrats who are the patrons of our institutions because he was himself a cynical kleptocrat. Think about the climate of cynicism about the relationship between money and power and the really rank idea of corruption that he told everyone is everywhere in that campaign that served as the basis of an ironic kind of um, legitimation because he was the one who is <laughs> so thoroughly unprincipled ostensibly, right, as, to, as ostensibly to see how it how it all worked and break through it. Only a swamp creature could, could drain the swamp. So I, I, I name those as the thoroughly unreconciled poles of our official, of our public conversation, as it were, about money in politics, in which the first one, the spectacularly naive one that does so much to throw wide open the floodgates of forces that contribute to the second, is the one that actually gets the last word on what our constitutional compact means, the, the Supreme Court. Um, I said I, I risked superficiality and I'm afraid I fell into it, but, but I, I, those are evocative for me of what we're talking about. I think that's right. Um, Leah, do you wanna to respond to this quickly? Sure, just quickly, and I'm, I'm thinking about this idea of explanation and sacrifice, and also thinking about some of the reasons why we see undemocratic behavior. And, and part of, I think, what we see is a frustration or kind of a, an expression of the illegitimacy of the state or state illegitimacy that is rooted in these ideas. And I want to thank David for, for highlighting one of these political institutions that I think is central here. Um, the failures of these various political institutions, but also the failures of private institutions, including media organizations and the role that we expect media to play as opposed to the role that media ends up playing in this larger kind of this larger arena. But I also want to think about um, what would be necessary and what are the kinds of things that are happening on the ground that would be necessary in order to kind of stem the tide of this, um, you know, anti-democratic or undemocratic, these various trends. And I think it's, it's something that's uh -huh. bigger than reform. Certainly we see some of these, some of the ways in which democracy has been expanded with works, you know, works from people like organizations like Fair Fight or the New Georgia Voter Project and say Ufat or something like that. But I also, I, I also want us to think about what it would mean, and I'm, I'm kind of throwing this back, I think, to the other panelists and to the audience, but what it would mean for a radical overhaul of something that investigates institutions beyond the idea of voting. And I understanding that voting, I understand that voting is a central concept 
with regard to a democracy and, and being a part of a democracy, but it's just one part. And I want us to think about something bigger, particularly in the reinvigoration, reimagination of these various institutions that essentially act as upholders of norms of democracy, right? So, but also act as exclusionary kind of agents of democracy. So how can we rethink that? And what are, what are ways that people are actually rethinking that in the larger body politic that have, that have immediate results or even whether it be short-term or long-term results that actually allow people not simply to hear explanations about you know, why things are happening, but actually allow them to feel democracy in their day-to-day -day lives that have mm -hmm. immeasurable impact. Yeah. yeah, it reminds me of uh, Suzanne Mettler's very uh, incredible book, The Submerged State. Yeah. Uh, all the ways in which people might understand the policies they enact to actually have some sense in the world are papered over in part by poor institutional design uh, as well as um, poor explanation. Um, I wanted to follow up with you Leah, on, on, on one point, you, you started talking about um, anti-democratic institutions and uh, <laughs> you are a, the leading historian of the Republican Party. Uh, and um, I mean, it is striking the level of resistance that uh, People on the right, not all, many have courageously stood up, particularly state officials, local officials, some national figures, uh, but there's been an enormous amount of resistance on the right to the validity of the election. Um, the, uh, there's been a lot of support for, you know, pretty partisan gerrymandering, um, voter suppression. Uh, there's a lot of concern about wink and nods toward political violence in the street, uh, demagogic figures that are being embraced in certain ways that are being retweeted or quoted or subtweeted. Um, what are the forces on the right driving these anti-democratic efforts? And what should democracy's response be to anti-democratic movements that are using democracy to achieve their ends. Right, so there, I wanna think about this question as a multi-tiered question in part because I think there is a, there is a response that is necessary in, in the immediate for thinking about the anti-democratic anti authoritarian trends that are running through, you know, essentially the modern Republican Party right now, and not without debate and not without, you know, difficulty and struggle. Certainly, that is a conversation in and of itself. But I also, what I also don't want to do is to allow that strain and to allow that trend to essentially let the Democratic Party off the hook, because I think part of what is well, part of what is happening now is that because the, the anti-democratic trend, the authoritarian trends that we're seeing within conservatism are so abrupt, so in your face, so rooted in the kind of concept of the retention of power, right? Just pa like naked raw power Absolutely. that it ultimately lets, you know, allows us to smooth over or at least allows us to pull, uh, pass a veneer of respectability onto anti-democratic anti trends that are also bubbling up within the Democratic Party, right, more recently. And I think some of the other panelists have mentioned this, particularly when it comes to militarism, particularly when it comes to kind of, you know, the, imper you know, the imperial empire or something like that. But also when I think about what is the role and responsibility of elected officials in the day-to-day -day lives of people on the ground. Um, you know, when we see a lot of the protests that erupt in 2020, those things are actually rooted much further back and they happen irrespective of who is in office because those anti-democratic trends that we see coming down from elites and from leadership at the top, right, don't necessarily care about partisanship. And so that's one part of what I want to think about. The larger, but at the same time, I do think there is a large pressing in our face issue right now that needs to be addressed with anti-democratic trends within you know, the mainstream Republican party. Again, that comes with much debate, with much struggle. Mm 
right? We have certainly people talking about democracy isn't the goal, right? We have other figures, very prominent figures saying things like democracy has failed. We need to try other approaches. And some of those other approaches look a lot like authoritarianism. And I think part of what we're talking about is, again, in some respects, it is a frustration with the failure of political institutions. That's, that's on the one hand, and that's a viable thing. We see some of these strains erupt, for example, amongst the Tea Partiers, amongst people on the ground who may not be economically anxious, certainly they are not, but they are anxious about transformations in the United States that their state, the state hasn't given them answers for, right? And this, I think, brings it back to a point that David, both David and Jed made. But the other aspect of this, I think, that we have to talk about is this kind of naked consumption of power. And, you know, there are all kinds of questions about economics, about kind of, um, I think, larger ideas of influence, but how power ultimately, I think, corrupts in a sense that it allows for this strain and this retention of, the, uh, a retention of these kind of uh, corrupt institutions and allows for the proliferation of many ideas that are inherently anti-democratic, right? Democracy is really bad for maintaining power. And I think that's one of the roots of, of kind of this, this push that we are seeing in this moment. How we solve for that, I think is a question for the next round of this conversation. <laughs> I don't wanna take up too much time. Thank you, you put a lot on the table. David, how about you respond? Well, let me just disagree with uh, what maybe I didn't fully understand in all its complexity, but the idea that uh, conservatism such as appeared in the 74 million uh, votes for the loser in this election uh, was all about the retention of raw power. Um, certainly the oil interest, you know, on the Republican side are a version of raw power, just as the Silicon Valley interests on the Democratic side are a version of raw power. Um, but I think a great many people uh, in states that were contested, both in 2016 and 2020, are not economically secure, are not without anxiety. They are not old uh, and um, somehow just, um, you know, traditional Americans whose complacency has been ruffled and disturbed. They're, they're some of the losers. Um, there are worse losers in our culture, perhaps, but we shouldn't speak about that without a great deal of economic knowledge, which perhaps is one of the things this panel does not possess. Um, it, it was a right wing uh, broadcaster I heard the other night, Tucker Carlson, proposing uh, that the, lar the brunt of uh, taxation uh, for these COVID months fall on the large corporations that had profited most during COVID time, like Amazon, Netflix, and Google. And yet, I don't think there's a shred of a chance that a Democratic Party administration is going to lay those taxes on organizations that are so sympathetic to the Democratic side. So this brings us to a, a different question, which I'll just introduce, which is the fact that the left liberal side owns respectable culture and the right owns demagogic politics. There is this divide between culture and politics, which is of long standing. And one of the things uh, I think that, ren that render conservatives of all ages, um, and not, not only white, uh, anxious, uh, is the feeling that the, the names, the, the touchstones, the ordinary, um, you know, uh, associations of their culture are passing out of sight too rapidly. Their kids are going to schools where they're being taught to use this word, not that word. And the this word is something brand new and the that word was, was something that wasn't considered impolite until yesterday. This has, this gradually penetrates people and it, it um, uh, it's like the ground under your feet starting to shift. I've never lived through an earthquake. Well, I've lived through small ones uh, in California, but never a big one. Um, I think it can feel that way. And um, when people are um, uncertain to that degree, um, 
they can be budged very far, very fast in their political views and their idea of what constitutes proper political conduct. Jed? If I, if I could just say something um, that starts from Leah's um, call to think about democracy beyond voting and passes through David's um, ironical but um, pointed invocation of Tucker Carlson. There was a strand of mobilized politics in the last two presidential rounds that called for, as, as we all know, well, I'm not telling us anything that we don't know, that called for both a genuine populism and its mistrust of large concentrations of power, particularly economic power, and advanced the vision of economic citizenship. That wasn't the language exactly, but that was the idea that if you're a member of this place, this polity, this economy, if you make your life here, there are certain respects in which you should be secure and in which you should be capable and even powerful if unions as well as social provision and guarantees are part of that story. And that strand was defeated in the democratic primaries twice. And if the party of good government and the best moral intentions, which is my party, um, does not, is not forced to a reckoning with that aspect of democracy. The aspect that says, in a sense, if we are here as equals, if we want to give 21st century meaning to Lincoln's characterization of democracy, when he famously said, as I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master, that expresses my idea of democracy. If that means all of these dimensions of economic capacity and power as the marks of membership, there are so many ways that we deny meaningful membership to one another, meaningful participation to one another. And if we don't, if we don't reckon with that, I don't see how a progressive party can hold power on anything more than the prospect of keep, keeping the barbarians from the gates for another four years, which is basically what they ran on this time. Um, David, did you have? You I just wanted to, since uh, Brandon, you brought up John Stuart Mill and his hope that the truth would triumph in a fair field eventually. Uh, I just wanted to mention one, since I'm glad to hear Mill invoked and in that essay on liberty. Another um, a point he makes there is that ideally the, for, for the sake of liberty, and he, he cares about equality too, but that essay is about liberty. Um, you would want the maximum decentralization of power and the maximum centralization of information. Mm -hmm. We have the opposite. No, it's absolutely crucial. Um, I was going to ask another thing, but but let me just follow up on this point um, really quickly, because we're getting a lot of questions about the new media environment and social media. And um, I'm curious as to, uh, there's some of the questions that seem to suggest very deep seated uh, kind of human nature arguments about the way in which we respond to information we don't like, the way in which we um, experience losing out on things that we really want. Uh, and that that's just not the kind of beings we are, that, that this is always gonna cause a problem, particularly in um, this sort of uh, media and information environment. Um, and we, we have some questions that raise um, some points about the way in which the social media culture might be corrosive, right? That it makes it harder to discern facts, 
uh, to start from a common set of facts. And a thing that I'm really interested in and would love to hear you say more about, um, particularly after David's uh, remarks, it's about humiliation. So I think that the social media era has made humiliation such a common language of politics and culture. It's made it an alluring strategy for demagogic power, for electoral strategies. And so much of uh, what causes the deep psychic investment in certain figures seems to be their ability to humiliate the other side. Um, I think certainly about the president, but I also think back to the correspondence dinner when Obama did the brutal takedown of Trump, which many people, I mean, Leah would know this more than anybody, if it in fact caused Trump to run. But we may have <laughs> engaged in the last four years in part because the man was humiliated uh, in, this, in this really um, disturbing way. But that itself was a response to a humiliation that, that was the birther movement. So, Which was done by tweets. Yeah. Which was done by tweets. So, so I'm just curious to hear you say something about this problem of the new media environment, the new information economy, given the kind of beings we are, given the kind of habits we have, and given the kinds of aggressive drives it seems to license. Uh, and let's, let's start with Leah here. Sure, I, I'm actually very curious to hear from the men on the panel because much of this is driven by masculinity and a sense of masculinity and it's in definitions, very clear definitions of masculinity. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really quite curious to how to think about how we frame this, right? And, and, you know, Brandon, you asked about the, you know, is this, was the myth of the birtherism, is that, you know, or the humiliation at the White House Correspondence Center, is that the moment? Well, according to his former, you know, uh, his former advisor for Black projects, Omarosa Manigault, that that's not actually the reason that he ran, that the reason that he ran was because he had nothing more in his life to achieve and the last remaining thing was the presidency, right? So, and this is actually, I think, a functional part of thinking about a larger trajectory or history of Trump, which talks or whether we want to call it an intellectual history, a political history, what have you. But this is a man that had dangled with or doled with the idea of the presidency largely in kind of masculinist terms for over 30 years, right? These back and forths, you can go back and trace this larger trajectory and this larger ideology with him, including a point in the 1990s where he said that he would run for president, but only if Oprah Winfrey would run as his vice president because it would be really great to have a black person and a woman on the VP because that was a ticket that nobody could beat, right? A white man at the top of the ticket, a black woman at the bottom of the ticket. <laughs> think about that for a second. But these larger questions of, I think, social media are ones that we have to pose, you know, in, in the larger conversation about democracy. When we think about how these tech giants thought about what social media would do and what the role of social media was, at the beginning, they argued that it was to broaden a sense of democracy, right? It was to expand democracy because everybody ha would have a platform, right? If you were a person who was you know, a history professor at a local university, that you could have 400,000 followers within a year. You could have a platform despite not having a platform anywhere else. We see it in all kinds of protest movements across the globe, right? It has a democratizing function. One of the things that we didn't anticipate, although certain legal figures we're finding out now within the say Facebook world, also within the Twitter world, also understood that it could have a fundamentally authoritarian or undemocratic function, right? Facebook was warned early on that it could, the platform could be abused because it wasn't neutral, right? People didn't perceive it as neutral, could be abused in order to discriminate against people in housing. What ends up happening, one of the largest kind of discriminatory housing complaints that we've seen in decades. We also know that it could be infiltrated by various forces, various, various aesthetics, various avatars to pretend to be certain kind of, you know, whether it be uh, citizens, whether it be, you know, uh, certain demographic groups um, in order to change the outcomes of democracy. And so that's the one area that I've been fixating on, particularly since congressional findings have shown that you know, Black and Latino voters in particular were targeted in 2016, again in 2018, again in 2020, and in, and in a way that amounted to essentially digital warfare, right, in order to suppress, oppress, and depress their votes. And so I want us to think about 
what are the anti-democratic functions of social media in an arena and in an institution that was created in order to have a democratizing function, right? David, you want to follow up? Yeah, I, I I don't know who created it exactly, and so how to estimate the democratizing fun. I know there were hopes for it to have a democratic um, influence, but the social media, which I don't participate in, so I'm speaking as an outsider observing its effects. But I do I do look at it via Google. I look at various people's tweets um, occasionally, and. Um, it seems to me part of the large project of the 21st century, which is the destruction of privacy. Um, Twitter, for example, is, and the, the kind of privacies that are shared on both Twitter and Facebook um, aims to evacuate and monetize, uh, destroy and transform uh, the private sphere. Uh, and. Uh, Privacy, uh, I'll lay this down as an axiom, which uh, I hope nobody asks me to define too closely in less than an hour. Um, privacy uh, is essential to liberty, as I would understand liberty, and as I think anyone uh, with an idea of, of personal will would understand liberty. Um, and we're living in a publicity regime. Uh, one thing about the most powerful Twitter manipulator in the world, Donald Trump, is that it is impossible to imagine him having any but a public life. It is a life lived for and, and in publicity. But a great many people have the appetite for that. He didn't create them. They helped create him. There's a mutual influence and he's not the only uh, one we could speak of. Um, you know, one would like to inculcate much more than is being done these days, even in the schools, um, you know, the advice, to don't respond to everything. Uh, think a while, uh, don't press send. Um, and maybe it's easy for us to say we're academics, we have plenty of opportunities to talk. So we feel we're being heard and many people in this publicity world want to be heard and Twitter and Facebook and all the rest, give them an opportunity. But it has been disastrous, not only for the multiplication of so-called points of view, um, but for the way it becomes impossible to, to, to discriminate the authentic from the bogus. And people love the bogus for its own sake when it's halfway entertaining. That's one of the things we found out, found out not only about uh, you know, the, the, the world's greatest Twitter manipulator, but about many lesser ones who have more than one political side. They make jokes, they humiliate. Um, I'm tempted to answer, but I won't answer Leah's suggestion that humiliation is a masculine trait. Maybe I will answer just by saying gossip has been tr traditionally supposed to be a feminine trait. And a lot of that goes on on Twitter also, I think it plays up or plays down to the very worst human tendencies of all sexes, racist and kind. Um, Jed, did you wanna jump in or I have, a, I have another question that I really, I wanna get into, um, but I wanna make sure, I, I can't hear you. You're um, muted. I, sorry, I'm, I'm no longer muted. I would, I would um, I'd love to jump in, Superfest, if you don't mind, Brandon. Of course. Um, thanks. So there's this um, observation that Adam Smith makes somewhere in the theory of moral sentiments. This promises to be very quick and contemporary. He says that it matters more to us that others should share our resentments than that they should join us in our sympathies. And that may not hold as a general characteristic of human nature, but we've worked very hard to create an environment of late in which it is the case. Um, political thinkers have recurrently been interested in the ways in which we get in one another's heads. It's a great theme for Hobbes, for Tocqueville, for Smith in some ways, and, and on liberty, actually, and on the struggle to keep others out of, out of our heads for certain, for certain purposes so that, we can, so that we can have there the quality that David, I think, rightly refers to as privacy. It's a, a, a multifarious and, and very deep prize. Um, if you were to tell a stylized version of the last hundred years of capitalism as a series of waves of commodification of things previously uncommodified, the commodification of intimate experience, um, or at least of a publici publicity publicity 
um, rendered version of intimate experience and of feeling and particularly the commodification of resentment, which succeeds so powerfully, resentment and sadism as a pair succeed so powerfully on the market for social media sentiments. Um, we work in an environment which is not just a social media environment, which is not just congenial to, but has adapted to the brilliant commodification of those two appetites, our resentment and our sadism. And what we've learned about one another is that we all have, or are tempted by versions of the same resentments, maybe the same sadism. Well, this raises, uh... I think the one question that I most wanted to ask you all, um, cause it's one that I'm struggling with a lot and I try to ask smart people this question whenever I can, but it's um, sort of like to put it bluntly, why democracy at all then, right? If we've, you know, um, We've laid out these various human pathologies that we're susceptible to. Uh, we've got difficulties processing complex information. We've inherited uh, a whole legacy of racial domination and sexism that's shot through uh, our various habits and orientations toward uh, the sharing of public power. Um, and of course, although uh, as David has, has, has eloquently said, um, America's engaged in a fair amount of navel gazing and, 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 and not really attuned to the kinds of things that are done around the world in our name, there are emerging powerful societies that have rejected democracy as uh, the ideal form of government. China most prominently, but Singapore as well. And if you go to those places and talk to intellectuals, they'll say democracy has a competency problem, right? One of our questions from Joan Rubin is about an educated citizenry. And we've always linked these things together, an educated citizenry and democracy. But how do you bring that about? How is that, how would they be educated enough to make good decisions about long-term economic planning, about, Jed, you've written a lot about climate change. Right, This long, slow-moving, complex threat with lots of negative externalities. How do we trust the demos to make the right decisions about that, as opposed to um, you know, a group of scientists informing the Communist Party in China to make the world's largest number of solar panels? Uh, how do we deal with the fact that democracy seems to have faltered and preparing for something like the COVID pandemic, which is low probability, highly devastating, right? Um, in short, <laughs> it's like given the scale of the kind of problems that you all talk about, why should we have any faith and hope in democratic rule by ordinary people? What could possibly justify that? May I speak quickly to that so that I can then step back and, and let the other two speak? Um, in this national history, I have no confidence that anything other than the political register of democratic idealism, of egalitarian freedom, can offer any hope of overcoming the forms of inherited brutality that Leah has invoked. So that's one who's like what rightly invoked. I think it's what we it's it's what we've got for that reparative and reconstructive work. Um, for another <clears throat> on the question of competence to, to take that on squarely. I think even under our present degraded circumstances, we have um, parties and institutions and politically serious movements that are perfectly capable of formulating and advancing the kinds of politics that would be necessary to register an understanding of and engage problems like climate change. Um, <clears throat> and this is despite the profound nihilism about the capacity of politics. It is the symptom of the sort of incapacitation 
of legislation and the decoupling of elections from results that I talked about earlier, even under those circumstances. So I think the fact that a healthy democracy under complex circumstances would always have to engage in significant delegation to technicians isn't, isn't a problem per se. Um, and I don't think we are as human beings incapable of generating this, this, the level of intention that would be necessary to give the technicians uh, direction. Um, so I think we are in the, we find ourselves in the circumstances, a classic American situation of looking at Americans as they have been historically and institutionally formed and saying, ah, well, there's a human being for you. <laughs> and in this case saying, um, well, this shows that we really can't do democracy. Well, we haven't quite given ourselves the chance to try. I'll say one more thing very quickly, and I know I'm speaking sort of um, epigrammatically here, at least in a compressed way. There have been two kinds of intellectual naivete and respectable conversation about, about democracy in this country. And they've in some ways shared a common trope, but they pointed in very different directions. One is the idea that if you just have more or less a uh, liberal market society, the rest takes care of itself mm -hmm. and elections that keep elites in rotation. Now we can see, I think for a variety of reasons that doesn't work, it doesn't work here and it doesn't work as a trade agenda that's supposed to bring democracy everywhere, trade plus intermittent invasions to set up more appropriate constitutions. Um, the other view has been that we can somehow understand the psychological and practical structure of democratic citizenship from the point of view of neoclassical economics and understand democracy just as a kind of homo economicus collective action problem. Um, so the first leads to naivete, the second leads to cynicism. Naivete fostered under the first contributes to our surrender to our institutional failures, which actually makes the cynical view more plausible because we're not making anything happen or giving people enough reason to come out and try to make things happen. But I think all of this is historically specific, institutionally specific, has to do with a certain intellectual trajectory, among other things, and um, doesn't close the case against democracy or against American democracy. David, you wrote the book on Edmund Burke. <laughs> well, I'm not gonna quote you the passage <laughs> Of Burke that begins a perfect democracy is the most sh is the most shameless thing in the world as it is the most shameless it is therefore the most fearless because I'm not going to speak as he does there uh, against democracy but it does seem to me and and just to take the the negative uh, perspective on this again that the the um, democracy regarded as a political system which is the main uh, point of view from which we want to address it, I think, uh, is mainly valuable uh, as a protection against tyranny. Um, if people feel that they have a material stake in government, they're not going to let the government abuse them. And the government that is by the people, by the people as well as being uh, of and for the people, which every government professes to be, um, you know, is, is is going to have some some built-in stamina, let's call it, uh, that uh, tends against uh, tyranny. Of course, there is, as as Burke warned, and as Jacob Talman uh, spoke of in a great book, um, you know, there is such a thing as as democratic tyranny. The French Revolution was a uh, sort of uh, example of that in its second and third stages. Um, but uh, you know. In this country, besides the presence of the often flawed and imperfectly operating uh, political mechanism for democracy, we've had, and maybe all of us have underrated this in the remarks preceding, um, we've had something like a democratic culture, which it, it goes with inequality, it goes with violence, it goes with lots of contradictions, but 
you know, consider consider it relative to the rest of the world rather than against the background of its own extreme idealistic promises. The degree to which in this country, two people approaching each other on the street, you know, reasonably well-dressed, but not obviously rich or poor, don't presume a whole lot about each other, can just start talking to each other when we did walk on sidewalks and streets. We haven't been doing it for months. Um, and that, that um, democracy as part of manners, as part of culture, I think, has always been a hopeful thing about the United States. It's one of the things that made me love New York as a place, having come from LA, which is a comparatively placeless place where people don't walk by each other on the streets. Um, my fear to go back to social media is that that bodes a democratic tyranny of manners but a tyranny that's so volatile, it changes dress every few weeks or every, every few months, but where there is there is a considerable degree of, of um, coercive influence on people. To Jed's point, and he uh, knows a great deal about this, which I do not, about climate change and what you would need to develop uh, a regimen for uh, fighting against the worst possible effects of climate change, retarding the effects, uh, guarding against um, what we're already experiencing in the new weather. Um, I don't think democracy as such, the voters just say what they want, is well equipped to deal with something on the scale of, of uh, global climate catastrophe, but I don't think nations are equipped to deal with it either. It is going to be experts uh, whom we can be asked to consent to with some information, with good explanations, and it's going to come with international agreements. So I don't see climate change as, what to say, being resistant to democracy any more than it's resistant to nationality. So one of the things I'm happy about this format is that uh, we get to have two conversations. So I'm trying not to uh, squeeze everything in this time. There's gonna be so much more to talk about next time. But I want to give Leah an opportunity to, to speak to this point. Um, and then I want to I want to follow up with one question from Q&A uh, and then and then one totally unfair question that I'll end on and that you can wait. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so in, in this last like little bit of time, because we only have a few minutes, let's let's try to keep answers short. Um, so Leah, be expansive here, and then I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll try to keep answers pretty, pretty short. Sure. So I think one of the things that I fundamentally believe about democracy is that democracy is a great system, right, when it is working correctly, right? And so democracy as envisioned is a great system. And there's a reason why I think when we see people that are committed to expanding democracy, to, you know, um, pushing democracy, to remaking democracy, think in terms of, even the most radical of them, still think in terms of a democratic system as envisioned, right, as opposed to in practice. So we see all of these great moments, right? We see the women's suffrage movement. We see the civil rights movement. Even the Black Power movement exist within an ideological framework of governance that is committed, for the most part, to these ideas of democracy. Now, they may engage in undemocratic practices at times, but I, they're still at its very core. They understand that democracy is a really good system when it works correctly and for everyone involved, particularly around this idea of egalitarian freedom. Now, I think just to kind of close out and thinking about, you know, how does democracy right, work uh, in solving some of these really big questions? Um, I think democracy, right, one of our problems with democracy is that it hasn't worked really well in answering some of these really big questions, that it has broken down in a number of places. But I would argue that the areas where that it is, where it's really broken down hasn't been necessarily a function of democracy, but rather when people have defined democracy in exclusionary terms and in exclusionary ways. I'd also say, and I'm going to try and make this real quick, um, just to, to close out on this, that I, again, want us to think about democracy as something bigger than simply voting or pre political preferences. I want us to think about democracy as the act, you know, of the act of engaging, right? An active process. Right? When I think about protest, protest is part of the democratic idea or the democratic arena, right? 
engagement, dialogue, civil dialogue, whatever we want to call it, that is part of the democratic process. And so I think that there is a way, and in fact, what we've seen in these moments, including in this moment of, of uh, global pandemic and racial pandemic, is that in fact, there have been moments where democracy has been working extremely well to correct for areas where democracy has uh, done very poorly. So that's why I want us to think about democracy as something bigger than simply you know, a voting moment or casting ballots or engaging in kind of this civic engagement, something much bigger than that. Yeah, I, I think that's a really important point. I mean, th this idea of the social movement as a constitutive element of democracy, right? Uh, as itself a kind of, in, in certain forms, a, a democratic practice. Uh, I've written quite a lot on Martin Luther King right. and civil disobedience. And um, I understand that in, in, in certain, when conducted in certain ways to be part of a democratic practice. Um, and so that might be one thing that we think, at least Leah, uh, and, I, and I agree with you here, um, is an institution broadly conceived uh, in our society uh, that, that's still functioning, <laughs> um, that social movements are still able to get out, change the agenda, put pressure on politicians uh, to try to fix sclerotic democratic institutions and other kinds of injustices. Um, but one of the questions we have on the table is that, you know, in our very sobering uh, and, and, and difficult conversation, we've raised the failure of pretty much every major institution in American society, the media, educational institutions, financial institutions. Um, and the, the, the question from, from Corey McCall is, are there institutions that are vital for democracy that aren't somehow broken in this country, that are not broken. <laughs> uh, we've got the social movement piece, but David, Jed, do you have any other things to, to suggest that is there something that you think is not fundamentally broken? Um, well, uh, I would say that the lower courts as witness recent decisions on the way from the voting to Inauguration Day, the lower courts haven't seemed to exemplify a broken system. Um, uh, so that there's part of the judiciary um, that we can say lives up to its civic duties and its idea of the virtues internal to the practice of a judiciary. One of my neighbors is a retired lawyer. Election day, I passed her on the street at a social distance. And she was, listen she was listening to the results on, on the uh, cell phone. And I said, you know, uh, he's, uh, it, it, he's still uh, contesting a lot of this. The, the swing states seem like a problem. It's all going to go to the courts. She shook her head and said, he hasn't appointed enough judges to get him through this. <laughs> so you may call that an accident of numbers, but, you know, there seemed to me some hope there. And I also find hope in some of the dissident um, media, which is available online. Some of the people who are now going on to Substack. Um, like Matt Taibbi, um, saying things that can't be said elsewhere and need to be said. It's a strange mutation by which the, you know, mainstream liberal magazines I used to trust and write for now seem to be shy of a certain kind of controversy, which is important for getting all the facts out there. But it does seem to me there's hope in developments like these. Yeah. <clears throat> I'll have to put over part of my answer to, to our next conversation, but much more seems politically sayable and has recently seemed politically possible in this country than would have been either sayable or possible 10 years ago. A whole set of claims for equal treatment, for security, for historical clarification and reckoning, um, for honest encounters with the actual and not mythic structures of power in the country have not just been sounded in seminars and not just sounded online, but actually um, been organizing claims for movements that have grown in power and ambition and looked for a time like they might um, produce electoral leaders 
and, and, and in a sense did, and in a sense may, may yet do. Um, that seems to me something very, very hopeful. People advanced, um, I'm thinking particularly of the Bernie Sanders campaign, that's my way in. It had many antecedents among them, Occupy, among the Moral Mondays movement, lots of other, lots of other places you can go. Um, people said things that were entirely unauthorized and which had been regarded as foolish about what you might deserve just for being a person who's here. And, um, and they found an audience and resonance and a glimpse of, of power. And I don't think that goes away, nor does the reminder it gives us that this thing is not over. Kantian enthusiasm. Okay, it echoes throughout. Um, I think that's right. There, there are conversations I'm seeing in the op-ed pages, I'm seeing on the street, I'm hearing from people I grew up with that I would have never imagined. They were things that were cloistered away in seminars a long time ago, and it's really opened up um, enormous dialogue in some spaces, and then it seems to shut dialogue down in some spaces. So I'm hoping in our second conversation, we can talk a bit more forthrightly about, about that um, that weird cultural contradiction, but we've officially run out of time. Uh, I'm gonna end with my very, very unfair question, but before I do, uh, <laughs> I wanna remind everybody that January 13th, we're reconvening. Please come armed with questions. Many of you were asking questions about uh, the, the, the most important question of all, what is to be done? That's what we're talking about next <laughs> time. Uh, we're talking about reconstruction, it's very important thematic organization. And I, I'm sure we will bring to bear all of the historical weight that that name uh, embodies. Uh, so I hope you all have a happy holiday and, and join us for the next time. But I would like to ask all of my panelists very briefly, since we've got a month in between these conversations and we're dealing with good humanities people who like to read, they all have bookshelves like the ones on display here. One book, central to your democratic faith, which should people read? Besides our own. <laughs> That's for next month. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm happy to jump in and say, I strongly recommend everyone read Du Bois' Black Reconstruction. Very good. I'll, I'll name something even shorter. <laughs> Um, Song of Myself, which is a, a poem uh, in whatever it is, 1,320 lines or something, not a whole book, but if you read it at the right pace, it'll, it'll take as long as a novel. Well, two of my favorites have been named. I'm going to hold over my answer until January 13th. <laughs> well, I will Sorry. throw in... Uh, Du Bois' Dark Water, which I think raises oh. really uh, resonant questions with our age. It's eerily, <laughs> um, it, it's an eerie resonance with some of the things that we're going through. Uh, but I hope we can talk about some of these texts next time. And I want to thank all of you. I want to thank Michael Washburn um, uh, and the Humanities New York team for, for putting this on. And I look forward to seeing you all next time. Thanks, Leah. Thanks, David. Thanks, Jed. Uh, and you all take care. Have a great holiday with your families. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon and everyone.